So if I can just quickly introduce uh, Rasmus Davidson. Uh, he's just submitted his master's thesis, is about to uh, be examined next week. Uh, he's from DTU Nanotech Department. Um, and it'll be an interesting contrast to see this presentation compared to the last one because the last was very much a market-driven innovation. They worked out where the business need was and then development, developed the technology from it. As far as I understand, this is much more of a, a technology push uh, innovation. So it's, it's developing the technology and then finding which market will best suit it. Um, so without further ado, Rasmus, take it away. Thank you. Um, yes, I'm Rasmus Davidson. Uh, here from DTU, from over from Nanotech, and uh, I want to tell you about the the startup company that I recently uh, was part of founding, uh, called Black Silicon Solar. And uh, today I'm just going to briefly give you an overview of the technology that we're working with, and uh, the market we're entering, and the business plan and the business model that that uh, I'm proposing. And then I'm just going to very briefly, just one slide, uh, go through some milestones that I went through. Um, in order to take this project from a, a student project into a, a full-time plus uh, real startup company. Because I think that, that might be maybe the most relevant for you guys uh, because you're all here with ideas and student projects that are ongoing and with a, with a wish to make it a startup companies at some point. So, so that will be my version of what, uh, what uh, Shannon and Lage told about uh, how it started and in between and how it ended and that kind of story. Um, and then finally, I'm going to give my, uh, my Venture Cup pitch from last year. Um, three minutes, maybe, but uh, we'll see. You can you feel free to, to take out your timers and, uh, and check if it's uh, on time. All right. So what is, is it that we do in, in Black Silicon Solar? We're etching nanostructures, like the ones you see here, into the surface of silicon. And we're doing that because these nanostructures make the silicon surface very, very black. And black means that we're absorbing almost all of the sunlight, all of the visible light. Um, and that's obviously a very desired property for a solar cell. And solar cells are typically made by silicon. That's the dominant material in that market. So that's, uh, that's what it's all about. And here's the more scientific version of something being more black and something absorbing more sunlight. So on this graph, you see the reflectance. So that's how much of the light is reflected back from the surface, which for a solar cell is basically just energy which is being lost. So the blue curve up there is untreated, polished silicon. So that actually works uh, quite well as a mirror. Uh, a lot of light is, is being completely lost, and that's not very desirable. And this is the reason when you compare the blue and the red curve, why solar companies spend millions of dollars in texturing their surfaces to absorb more sunlight. Because the red curve is a traditionally or conventionally textured silicon solar cell and how much light that reflects. But then you see the black silicon surface that we've developed at, at DTU Nanotech and you see that in, in the whole solar spectrum it actually absorbs more sunlight, it reflects less. Uh, so this is the reason why such as a nanostructured surface could be a great material uh, for a silicon solar cell. So what we propose to do is to etch these nanostructures into the surface of the, of the solar cell simply. And the sort of business or commercial aspect of doing this uh, comes into the picture when you look at how you produce a solar cell today. So this kind of production process consists of, of several dis different process steps. One of them being the texturing, this uh, surface texturing, uh, in order to reduce the reflectance as the, the graph showed. And that texturing step actually makes up a big part of the total process time and thereby also the total process cost. So what we want to do is to replace that step with a black silicon texturing, which is shorter in time and therefore also a cheaper way of doing this texturing. So this is why we can potentially not only make solar cells more efficient, because we absorb more sunlight, but also cheaper and faster to manufacture. So if we compare our black silicon method with conventional way of texturing, first of all, the reduced manufacturing cost, if we can, if we can obtain that, is the most important advantage. Because it's really all about the cost efficiency um, in the solar industry. So either you have to reduce your manufacturing cost or you have to improve 
the efficiency. And potentially we would like to do both because maybe the efficiency can also be boosted if we are able to absorb more sunlight. Then there are some secondary advantages. For example, the conventional texturing that method that they use today in the industry involves a lot of wet chemicals. Uh, some of them are toxic, some of them are flammable, very hard and expensive to handle. So by doing a dry, text, uh, dry etching, which this uh, black silicon is, uh, we can get rid of at least some of these chemicals and that could be a process advantage and it could also further reduce the cost. And last but not least, we've try to make a very simple one-step process of texturing these solar cells so that it's very applicable to all kind of silicon surfaces, meaning all kind of silicon solar cells. And this opposes a bit to some of the other solutions suggested in the research. They can be very advanced and they can be sometimes definitely not applicable to industrial solar cells. So we've tried to, to do it the other way around. So this is some of the reasons why this solution could be a, a cost competitive way of, of doing it. And the, the reduced manufacturing cost is the most important thing because when you look at the solar industry, the biggest problem is that solar energy is still too expensive compared to other energy sources. So somehow the cost efficiency of solar cells need to be uh, improved. Uh, in other words, the, the big solar companies, the cell manufacturers, need to reduce their manufacturing cost or improve their, uh, their efficiency of the solar cells um, and preferably do both at the same time. And that's the quite ambitious goal that, that we have. So if we look at the... Now we're diving into the, the business model, as you can see. But if we look at the market, just very briefly, the solar cell market is estimated at $50 billion and our addressable segment within that is part of the production, uh, and that's still uh, a valid uh, $700 million. Uh, and more interestingly, it's a rapidly growing market. Uh, I believe in the past decade or two, it's been uh, annual growths of 20% on that order. So it's, it's a rapidly growing market. Um, and within this market, we're targeting the, the biggest solar cell manufacturers in the world, basically, because we're, we want to replace a process step in the manufacturing uh, and save them money per watt they produce. So larger capacities means a larger potential. Um, and in doing this, we actually also want to partner up with the equipment manufacturers, the companies that already supply uh, manufacturing equipment to our potential customers. Um, and we want to do this because then the, the business model could look a bit like this, where we Black Silicon Solar license this technology to these large solar cell manufacturers. But they're very hard to, to get in contact with if you don't have any prior uh, relations with them. And also, in order to employ our technology, which we're just selling as a, a licensing uh, model, they need some equipment. And these guys in the middle, the big equipment manufacturers like Applied Materials in the US or Central Therm in Germany, uh, they both have the prior contact and they are able to supply the equipment. So that's why we thought this business model could actually be a good way to, to do it. So we license the technology, they pay a licensing fee in return, and that's, you could say, a traditional licensing model. So if we look a bit more of the, on the financial part of the how, how can we make money and, and how much do we estimate that is in this. If we compare the conventional texturing I talked about with black silicon, uh, the first thing you notice is that we go from 40, 50 minutes, sometimes even an hour is being reported, down to only a couple of minutes of process time. And more importantly, that results in an overall cost reduction of the manufacturing of a solar cell of, of up to 10%, at least in our estimation so far. And 10% can actually be translated into a lot of money in the solar industry. Uh, that it is dealing with large capacities and so on. So if we take Q-cells from Germany, uh, one of the biggest solar companies, as an example, every time they would produce a watt of solar energy replacing their texturing step with the black silicon, they could save 10 US cents per watt they produce. And then with an annual production of 900 megawatts, this equals to uh, an annual saving for Q-cells of $90 million. So even with a relatively small percentage in licensing fee that we would take from this single customer, it still adds up to, to millions of dollars. So that's why 
these numbers uh, are very interesting, even though it's smaller percentage savings in manufacturing cost. So right now the status of the, the project, the status of the startup company is that um, a couple of years ago we, we made the lab scale proof of concept, meaning that we made a functioning solar cell with a certain efficiency and a certain performance that used this black silicon surface. And we compared it to a solar cell without black silicon. And that uh, worked very well, but it wasn't really a fair comparison. So what we need to do is to, at some point, really compare with commercial solar cells with this conventional texturing compared to black silicon. Based on the lab scale proof of concept, we have filed a, a patent application in the US last year. Uh, it hasn't been completely finalized yet. That's also a financial issue there, but uh, uh, we have a, a priority date, as it's, uh, as it's called. Uh, and right now, um, I'm in the middle of making this commercial prototype, uh, this commercial proof of concept, comparing a solar cell with conventional texturing with the black silicon. Um, that will give us our sort of efficiency number. And then at the same time we need to have a number on the cost because then we have cost efficiency. And uh, my Swedish uh, business partner uh, is right now dedicating his master thesis to a more detailed cost analysis. And I've spent my master thesis on building this commercial prototype and I'll continue doing that in the next uh, six months. And fortunately, we have uh, received some Danish, uh, I think it's partly governmental funding, called gap funding, and that will cover the next six months of me developing this prototype here and uh, Yalma de developing a cost analysis report in London um, and some other major steps. So, so that's where we are at right now. We are still developing this prototype uh, in order to get this number on which cost efficiency can we offer the customers, because that's really what it's all about. It's, it's a matter of the dollar per watt cost of solar energy, how can we affect that? And if we can't uh, prove any savings on dollar per watt, we're not in business. So, so this is what it's all about right now. Before I, I'm going to jump to my Venture Cup pitch, I just uh, want to go through these milestones, uh, because this shows a bit uh, of my development with this project, um, and how it, in, in about two years, um, went from being a student project uh, into also being a startup and my full-time job and, and, and things like that. So for me, it started with my bachelor project at DTU Nanotech. Uh, I actually applied for doing a project about uh, this black silicon as uh, explosives detection. I thought that sounded very interesting. And, uh, and my, my, one of my supervisors is an expert in, in exactly this. But then we sat down and discussed this material. Okay, so it's silicon which is the dominant uh, solar cell material, and it's, uh, it's completely black. It absorbs more than 95% of the sunlight. So maybe that could be even more interesting uh, as a solar cell material, and if I wanted to take on that, uh, it could be a completely new project. Um, so I, I decided to do that as my bachelor project, and we got this lab scale proof of concept. Um, so based on that, I, I submitted the idea to this Conduced competition, which is also held this year, in a couple of months, I would encourage you all to um, maybe submit something, but at least uh, go over there and have a look. Uh, I'm sure they're going to be great, uh, great ideas. Um, and I didn't really think more about that uh, this competition. I didn't win the first prize or anything. Uh, it was a nice experience. But then a couple of months after, I realized that it was actually quite important that I showed up, even though I didn't know that whether this idea was, whether there was any potential in that. Because then DTU got the chance to, to send a student with an, in, uh, an energy project to Abu Dhabi, to one of the biggest uh, energy conferences in the world. And, and so they called me based on what they had just briefly heard at Grand uh, And of course, I wanted to, to, to go there. So I went in January 2011 and presented the, the solar cell project. And there I actually met the Swedish student who is now doing the cost analysis report. And he was very interested and, and said, well, we should uh, make a business uh, plan about this. Uh, now it's just technology. We should make some, some business thoughts and uh, maybe submit it to, to this uh, clean tech competition in London at London Business School that he had heard about. So we did that and went to, to London in April last year and ended up uh, winning that competition. So now it was suddenly, and that was at a business school. So now suddenly some business people and investors 
found it interesting and not only from a technology point of view. So I went back and talked with a lot of people here at DTU, my supervisors, and, and I was very encouraged to then submit to Venture Cup because this is also a business plan competition and as far as I know the biggest in Denmark and, and, and they have a clean tech category so, uh, and we just won a clean tech business plan competition in London. So I sat down and quickly wrote the, the business plan and submitted and ended up uh, winning the, the, the Venture Cup. Uh, and which was a huge step because then you get some 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 cash and you also get a lot of accounted uh, or oh, sorry uh, consulting from for example lawyers and patent agents and, uh, and and business advisors so that was very important and that was definitely the point where i decided okay now this is this is full time plus this is uh, this is what i'm going to be doing and also dedicating my master project to uh, developing this technology so that's what i've been doing the last uh, six months uh, making new kind of solar cells working with this black silicon as my master project. Uh, I'm going to defend it next week. Uh, and then, as I said, right after delivering uh, that defense uh, for the next six months to come, I'm going to do the, the further research here at, at DTU. So, so I'll be around and uh, depending on the, how it goes, uh, I've written a question mark here, we'll see, depending on the results. Uh, but I'm pretty sure it will somehow involve uh, black silicon also in uh, six months time. All right, so um, I'm going to try to give my Venture Cup uh, pitch from last year. Um, yeah, the timers are ready. <laughs> um, all right. So welcome. I'm here to present black silicon solar cells. Solar cells indeed possess the potential of becoming an abundant renewable energy source of the future. Because every day the sun delivers as much energy to the earth as we consume in a whole year. But the problem for solar cells is that solar energy is still way too expensive compared to other energy sources. And I'm here to present a possible solution to this problem called black silicon solar cells. Now a black silicon solar cell has nanostructures like these on the surface. And the nanostructures make the solar cell black. This means it absorbs more sunlight than a regular silicon solar cell. And that can again imply the solar cell becoming more efficient and also up to 10% cheaper. And the business model that I propose for this technology is actually to take the recipe behind this nanostructure, the know-how of how to implement it at a solar cell company and all the, pa and the patent protection behind it and sell this as a package solution to the large solar cell companies like Q-Cells in Germany. And every time a company like Q-Cells use black silicon instead of what they're doing today, they could save 10 US cents per watt of solar energy they produce. We will take a 25% license fee uh, of that saving or gain. And with an annual production of, of 900 megawatts by Q-Cells, this actually gives black silicon uh, solar a million dollar revenue as soon as they implement it partly or full scale at some point. Uh, so we will break even as soon as they start implementing it, only a 10% implementation, and then as soon as they go full scale, we will have a two digit uh, million dollar revenue. We will need some uh, investment for the first year of further R&D and also uh, for finalizing the patent application. The team consists of myself, my a Swedish business co-founder and four professors from DTU, two experts in nanostructures, one in solar cells and one in IP law. And black silicon technology can definitely make solar cells a more cost-efficient uh, energy source and thereby an abundant renewable energy source of the future. So therefore I want to encourage you all to replace black gold with black silicon. Thank you. And if there are any questions, I'll be happy to answer. <clears throat> yes, in the back. Uh, uh, just like in, I a little private question. You talked about the, the efficiency and the cost of solar energy. It uh, seems like it's not profitable for private users to put up solar energy today. Is that what you indicated? Um, what would the prognosis for the future be? What will be the spread easy for us, like if there's more solid fuel? 
Oh, that's a, yeah, that's a good and big question. And <laughs> unfortunately, I can't answer that uh, in, in, in detail because it's, it's very hard to say. But yeah, the problem is that it's not profitable enough yet for solar energy, uh, meaning that, for example, in Denmark, with the, uh, with the subsidies that we have, uh, it's very per country because countries have different governmental subsidies for this kind. In Germany, I believe you're nearly paid for putting up solar energy. So, so that depends. In the US, that's not the case. And in we're, Denmark, we're probably somewhere in between. Uh, but for example, in Denmark, I think it's like eight to 10 years of payback time. So it's really a matter of, of payback time because it is an expensive way of, of uh, generating power. But then if it is guaranteed to last for 25 years and, and it automatically generates power, then it's a matter of payback time. So, uh, but what I've read and heard is that uh, a lot is being done to approach this break-even point um, for solar energy. But that's assuming a lot of, as they say, new technologies. And simply, we hope to be one of those technologies because there's a great desire to, to drive down the cost. And that's a challenge for us because we know that if, if this is not done before five years, it's too late, probably. Um, but on the other hand, if it's done in six months, then we could be one of the solutions that helps drive down the cost, and that could be a good business model. So, yeah. Good answer. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. I was just wondering, uh, this uh, silicon surface, is that the top layer, or do we have another layer on top of your silicon? It is the top layer, um, but, but generally you would put uh, another glass layer or maybe multiple glass layers on top. Um, but either that layer would be to help the, the absorption of light even further. Um, and of course it's important that we develop this surface such that we can still do this technically. We can still put the layers on that kind of surface. But solar cells today are also textured. They're just textured through a different process, this uh, wet chemical. So it's actually the same concept, and that means uh, that we can do all the same things nearly as, as uh, they, you can do today with solar cells. And that's why it's, uh, you could say, a simple solution, because we know, that how, we know what to do with a textured surface. Yeah. So it's just differently textured. Okay. Yeah. Yes? It's, um, it's called a reactive iron edge, uh, so that's why it's, uh, it's a dry edge, not wet. So it's actually uh, certain ions that we force with an electrical field uh, vertically down on the silicon surface. And then uh, they react chemically um, with the silicon uh, to remove parts of the silicon surface. And then by adjusting pressure and the gas contents, we can sort of decide where the ions are hitting and in which order, and thereby creating different surfaces. Uh, so we can create more pyramid-shaped and more uh, cylindrical and something in between. And then, of course, measure what is best as a solar surface. Yes? Yeah, I think it was one of the first slide where you compared the texture of the black silicon. Um, can you explain that in a bit more detail? So the... Yeah. So the reflectance of light. Yeah, just how is it? Yeah. Yes. yes. So the reflectance is the percentage of all the incoming light which is being reflected back. And um, assuming that no light is, is transmitted all the way through the solar cell, then everything else uh, is absorbed. So that's sort of the three the three uh, things that can happen to the light. And so it's a function of the wavelength here, which is the solar spectrum. So that's the part of the sunlight that can create electricity in a solar cell. And um, basically, the blue curve is a polished silicon surface. So you would never put that on a solar cell. So that's a bit unfair for comparison. But it's just to show that there's a reason why we have to do something to the surface when making a solar cell, because else too much energy is being lost. The, the red curve is then a typical uh, reflection curve of that kind of surface they have today. And we saw that 
these different kinds of black silicon, we could actually, in some versions, we can have like 1% reflectance in the whole spectrum. And in the version that we would like to use for a solar cell, it's, it's something like this. Yeah. So how can the, the total reflectance be that uh, big at the traditional and small wavelength? Is there a reason why the curve is like uh, yeah, I mean, so the, what they do today is basically they have larger pyramids. They have a structure like that on the surface, and it, there's a lot of diffuse reflectance. So even though they look, solar cells today, they, they look very anti-reflective, actually. Um, but because we're working with a nanoscale surface here that basically encapsulates all the light and, and takes all the light in, whereas the other surface is more like a rough surface, that will still reflect in, in different directions. Um, so the, the underlying explanation of why it has that uh, reflection, I'm not sure. But, but you can see that uh, it, it always looks like that, uh, that kind of surface when you measure the reflection um, on, on commercially solar cells. Yeah. Yes? That's a, that's a good question. So I haven't been able to test, you could say, the mechanical duration of this, uh, this surface, whether, because as we talked about before, there's this warranty on solar cells. So you have to guarantee 25 years of, uh, of functioning at a certain level. So we can't have that these nanostructures are broken or something like that. But so far, uh, on the, the cells that I've made a couple of years back, and when we look at them again, they're not uh, destroyed or anything. Um, at least they're still black, and that's sort of the, the main point. So maybe they, they're very fragile, but as long as the surface is still black and it's still doing what it has to do, it's, it's, it's good. Um, and also, typically, it's covered with protective glass for mechanical purposes. But it's something we will need to test before anyone will buy it. Yeah. Yes. Uh, two questions. Uh, uh, for, for is it, why is it cheaper than the world to uh, sell them? How did you preserve uh, the winning one? Did you start it? How did I what, sir? How did you start the company? Uh, ah, okay. When you got the winning uh, one? Yeah. Okay. So, first question. Um, the main reason why it's cheaper, and I should say we have, we've just estimated from my experiments that it looks a lot cheaper. Uh, it can change when we do the real, really detailed analysis. But the main reason why it's cheaper is that the other way of texturing takes 40 to 50 minutes. Um, I've used 50 minutes in my master thesis, and the other, the black silicon method, just takes a couple of minutes, like 4 to 10 minutes or something like that. So that's orders of magnitude in process time. Mm. So even though that kind of chemical bath is maybe a bit cheaper per minute or per hour, then because we can do it in a very short time, it's, it's cheaper. And it's actually, in the 10%, I've not, I've not calculated anything about uh, labor cost or something like that. But if it turns out to be a bottleneck process today, and we can reduce the time by a factor of 10, then it could also be further cost reduction. But that's a whole, like, I'm going to leave that to the economists because, yeah. Um, the second question, yeah, I, um, I had the, the privilege of talking to Oroclean before I participated in the Venture Cup. So they told me all these uh, stories and the good tips. Um, so I, I managed to, to, to start a, just a simple personally owned company with a CVR number, as it's called in Denmark. Um, and that definitely uh, is, a, is a great thing to be aware of uh, before Venture Cup. Um, and still, there are some things about uh, ESU and uh, that kind of stuff. Uh, but I mean, uh, it's, it's, it's no reason not to, to go for the Venture Cup, but uh, good to be aware of, definitely. You, you, you can, but... But I think it's. Uh, well, we wrote a letter to uh, tax. They said no way. Yeah. No, no problem. <laughs> yes. Um, I was 
thinking about uh, the patterns you made. How, what, in which way did you, uh, what did you describe in your patterns? Yeah. So we can be sure to Good, good question. And it's for us, it's a, it's going to be a, a hard time to actually finalize the patent and really get the patent right because uh, there's a lot of patents in solar cells and in nanostructures, and there are also some patents combining, so in the very same field as we are. Uh, but what we've done so far is to both describe the way we do it and applying it on a solar cell and how the resulting st structure looks like and sort of just cross-combine them, because then the chance is there's at least something that no one else protected. But it's uh, patenting, it can be a, a jungle to, f to find your way in. It's, uh, yeah. But that would be my sort of immediate tip, just try to all sorts of combinations. Uh, someone are even talking about the software that is in the machine that you use, if it's high tech, because maybe no one thought about that. What you actually do is press a button and the software performs something on your substrate. That's, that's uh, legal stuff. <laughs> yes? Would you estimate your cost in the patent file? No, not in the patent, no. Um, I, you, you, you can, there's the, there are the claims in the patent where you say what you actually protect, and then there's something called background. And in my background, I basically just put my bachelor thesis. Uh, Oh, the cost of the patent. Oh, okay. Sorry, I, I misunderstood. Um, so I, I've talked with different patent agents and lawyers, and, and they say different things depending on also if you want to file in the, in the whole world. Uh, I think it's called a PCT or something. Or if you just want to file in a couple of countries. It depends on that. But if you want to, to go international, um, I'm pretty sure it's at least a couple of hundred thousand kronos. Um, and, and I would also say if you have 100,000 kronos and not more in the bank account and you are told you can apply for a US patent f for this, I would still wait because there's a lot of uh, maintaining fees and things like that. So definitely if you're a patent heavy company, you have to think about patenting also in the finances, because it's just uh, huge amounts of money, yeah. So what, what, what we basically did was to file what's called a provisional patent. So that basically gives you a date where you can go back and say, well, at this point back last year, we already knew this, we filed this, and they have that in the US on a document. But you can do that for 100 to $200, depending on how long the application is. So that's a very good option, I think, uh, if you just need something documented, but you don't have 200,000 kronos uh, that you don't know what to do with, so, the, yeah. The real cost in patenting isn't the actual cost for filing it, it's the, the labor cost of the experts to make sure they get all the legal language correct, to do the correct searches, to make sure your patent doesn't infringe on anyone else's. You can actually do your own for quite cheap, but, uh, the trouble is then you're risking the fact it might not be worth the paper it's written on. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, I'm sure you'll get some details on that next week. Um, could I ask a quick question? Yes, sure. Uh, you're, uh, you said you were going to lease uh, the technology out. Um, yeah. What's the, the funding model for the leasing? Is it a set price or is it dependent on the performance of your, or the added performance of your technology? So in, in the Venture Cup pitch and also after that, um, I've presented it as a percentage of the saving, which means that if it doesn't work or if it's just the same, if it does the same to the solar cells, we don't earn any money. We, we've sort of been asked uh, or we've been told by advisors to present it that way. Um, you, you could also, I mean, in some cases, maybe in other industries, you could take a smaller, a very small percentage of the overall revenue of the company but I mean, for a billion dollar solar company, no way they would uh, give me any percentage of their overall revenue. Yeah. So, so, but I would say that, that these kind of things is, is a matter of uh, opinion or religion even, because sometimes uh, people say, okay, every second time I present it, they say, you should do a percentage of the saving. <laughs> and every other time they say, no, no, you should maybe ask for a certain amount of, of money. So when, if you went with the percentage of the saving model, how much percentage of the saving of the 
the final sellers of the products do you actually claim? Or can you not say that at the moment? Well, um, here uh, I, we present it as a 25% saving of the save, uh, 25% of the saving, yeah. Okay. So if they save these uh, 90 million dollars, if they produce 900 megawatts, we would ask for 25% of that, uh, and that's on a yearly basis. Um, and that's why it, it could add up to a lot of money, and maybe, maybe they wouldn't do that. Um, but it's just from the premise that go, go below half, so it seems like they earn more than we do mm. on our technology. That's a Seems way to go about it. <laughs> um, okay, I think we're, we're out of time, but Rasmus, thank you very much for the, the pitch. Thank you. <laughs> so we'll take 15 minutes break. Um, I'll be back at quarter past for the next presentation by uh, Tommy. Is that Tommy? All oh, right. <laughs> okay. Uh, well, hopefully, we'll be here shortly. Um, so we'll see you at quarter past. <laughs>